Very rarely on Sunday mornings since I've been pastor at the church have I given a series that was topical in nature. Generally we are in a book of the Bible and systematically going through it. But I really felt impressed of the Lord or impressed in my spirit to share with you a series of messages on really developing the temperament of the Lord Jesus or patterning after the healthy Christ. I believe Jesus is healthy. And I believe that we can pattern after him. And in these next nine weeks, we're going to be looking at our life as compared to the Lord and seeing what resources are in the Lord's life that we can draw upon to live a more Christ-like life. As we think about patterning after the healthy Christ, I just want to, at the beginning, note two foundational principles that are involved in patterning our life after the healthy Christ. One foundational principle is this, that when we think of Jesus and being able to to come after him, we ought to recognize that the resources of which Jesus drew upon to live a wholesome, emotional, and temperamental, and mental life are also available to us. I think we do violence to the person of Jesus if in looking at him we say, oh, it was easy for him to live like that because he was divine. He was the Son of God. Well, of course, that's true. But Jesus also was human. In a mystery and in a way that we cannot perhaps ever fully understand. Fully God and fully man. And the scriptures tell us, Hebrews chapter 4, that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. If he was tempted in every way as we are, this means to me that he really faced the things as a man, as a human being, that you and I face as a human being. And if in his human nature he could be successful in in developing as he did, then we ought to look at what resources the Lord drew upon as a human and recognize that we ourselves can draw upon those same resources. In fact, Jesus said, I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And cannot we say the same thing? I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And can we not also say the words that Jesus gave to us? I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And part of being the healthy person that the Lord wants us to be is learning to recognize that we can draw resources from God to enhance our life. I think, though, that our ability to draw upon these resources is directly related to our obedience to the Lord. If we feel, when it comes to some of the traits and temperaments that I'm going to be speaking about over the next weeks, that those belong to someone else, and those are idealistic, and those can never apply to me, they may have well applied to the Lord, but, boy, you don't know the kind of rut and pattern and personality pattern that I'm in. How could I ever be like that? I think to have that attitude is to really throw in the garbage heap a whole lot of scriptures which tell us that we can be like the Lord Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, We have the mind of Christ. Can you look at all the things that you're wrestling with and looking at in your life and say that with the Apostle Paul? If you can't say it from truth at this moment, can you begin to say it from faith? We have the mind of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul notes, We take captive every thought to make it obedient unto Christ. In Romans 12, 2, we are exhorted, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All these scriptures are talking about our mind belonging to Christ, Christ being in our mind, and the opportunity that our mind can be renewed. And we are told by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. So would you join me in bringing your life to the Lord, and in these coming weeks, consciously seek to have the mind of Christ in you and pattern after Jesus. Our subject today is Jesus in you and at ease. And there are many people, um, myself among them, who at times are quite frankly not at ease, who may be bothered with worry and anxiety and a great deal of nervousness. 
And I think it's well when we look at the theme that Jesus can be in you in such a way that you are at ease, inwardly relaxed and calm. When we look at a subject like that, perhaps it's best to start with an inventory to begin to measure the level of peace in your life. If your life were to be equivalent to a car motor holding oil, that's the only illustration I can think of, the dipstick in my car, I take it out periodically to see what the level of oil is. What's the level of oil of at ease in your life? Are you a quart low? Two quarts low? Or is the red light coming on all the time and your motor is just about to burn up? The inventory of the level of peace in the Lord's life is fascinatingly presented to us in a time which we might well expect that the level of at ease would be very low. For when Jesus gives us what the inventory of his level of at easeness is, it is in the day or the evening before his crucifixion, the evening before he is to be betrayed by one of his own, when he is to be led out and mauled by soldiers and put upon a cross, and I would expect him to be very anxious and fretful in that moment. But what does he do in that moment? He speaks to his own, John 14, 27, and says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. If you were, if you were new that in uh, just a few hours you were going to leave your family and your friends and never to come back, what would you give to them as the leading attribute of your temperament? Could you say with the Lord Jesus of your family or your friends, my peace I leave with you? Or would it be my fears I leave with you? My anxieties I leave with you? I'm sure glad I leave my worries with you and I leave my bills as well. <laughs> I was talking to some of the staff this week who who know me rather well and know that I can uh, at times get uh, just a little bit uptight, I said to them, you know, this word has really been a strong word from me to the Lord. My peace I leave with you because I realize that if I, uh, if I uh, all of a sudden were to bail out and were to come to the pastoral staff and I were to be responsible for leaving them, uh, the leading characteristic of my temperament, it'd be a real, real question as to whether or not I could leave you peace. And uh, Wayne Tess said, yeah, I know what you would say. You would say, my pieces I leave with you. <laughs> How do you know what level of at ease or peace you have in your life? Let me ask you a series of questions and take a mental note as to whether you answer yes or no. Keep a scorecard. One yes, one no, two yes, one no, whatever. When we get done with the eight questions, you have, may have a fairly good idea of what level of at ease you're at in your life right now. Do you let things build up inside of you until you're about to explode? You feel ready to explode? That may be suggesting that uh, you're not really being able to live a day at a time. You're keeping stuff within you and that's acting against you. Another question. Do you use pills and medicines to help you relax? And here I'm not talking so much about... Uh, a once in a while kind of a thing, but as a regular pattern, do you find yourself in such a nervous condition or anxiety condition that you need to use pills or medicine or perhaps alcoholic beverage or some other inducement to be able to calm down? Isn't it very striking to look at the Lord on, as he comes to the cross and they want to offer him some uh, um, um, oh, painkiller? And he chooses uh, to, even in that moment, uh, refrain from the painkiller. So at ease is he within himself that he can refuse uh, the intoxicant. Do you, uh, do you worry a great deal about anything or maybe even about your health? Do you get tense and upset when there is a lot of work to be done in a very short period of time? Can you imagine uh, Jesus, how, how he could have wrestled with his temptation from time to time? He has literally all the world on his shoulders, so little time to do so much. Can you see him snapping at the disciples, coming in after realizing the pressure of going to the cross and saying, you dumb bunch of clowns, why don't you get with it? You know, the kick the dog syndrome. Do you get tense and upset when there's a short amount of work to be done, or a lot of work to be done in a short amount of time? Another question, is it hard for you to relax because you are busy all the time? 
You almost feel guilty if you sit down and take five minutes of complete relaxation. You've got to go, go, go. Remember what Jesus says when everybody is around him and he's the center of attention and everybody, it seems like, needs him. He comes to his disciples and he says, come apart and rest for a while. As actually happened, the crowds followed him and he didn't get that moment of rest. But at least that he was willing to break off and say, we need, there are moments in our life when we need to rest and relax. We don't have to stay uptight and driving all the time. <clears throat> Do you have difficulty in falling asleep? On a regular basis, maybe all of us once in a while have difficulty in falling asleep. Look at the Lord. Uh, he is on uh, one occasion so uh, uh, in a dangerous situation, a storm at sea, everybody else is panicked. And where is the Lord? Asleep on a pillow in the back of the boat suggests to me that he was able on a regular basis to sleep, even though he didn't have a regular home. Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Yet he seemed to be able to get a good night's sleep. And there are other occasions when he chose to discipline himself to awaken a great while before day and continue in prayer. Another question. Do, do other people think of you as a tense, high-strung, nervous person? Do you think of the Lord that way? Do you think of Jesus as a tense, high-strung kind of a person? who rolls over everyone to, in order because he's got a job to do and, and he's, just, he's just uptight to get it done. And one last question. Do you often feel restless or jittery without knowing why? Well, wh what, what were the levels of yeses and noes? If you have a whole lot of yeses, it may suggest that you're a, a person who is finding it difficult to relax and to be at ease. A whole lot of noes and, and maybe you don't need this message so much. Maybe uh, you're already patterning after the Lord. What's, what's your level of at ease? Eight quarts out of eight, seven out of eight, six out of eight, whatever. Where are you at? I think if you find yourself saying a lot of yeses to the questions which I have asked today, we need to look at uh, examples that Jesus gave in order to assess results of the pattern of worry and anxiety which is being built in your life. Worry, as I would understand it, is a state of fearfulness, imagined or real. It blows a problem completely out of proportion. A classic example of it for, uh, if, that, I can, that comes off the top of my mind is the guy that was out on a country road and whose car broke down. And he went into his trunk to get, a, to get the jack and the spare tire out to change his tire. And lo and behold, his jack was gone. Spare tire was there. What's he going to do out in the middle of that country road? And so off in the distance... Uh, he uh, sees a farmhouse about a mile away and he says, well, I know I'll go. That farmer probably has a jack. I'll go ask him. So he starts walking toward the farmhouse. But as he begins walking, he began saying to himself, that farmer lives in a pretty nice house. He may not like people coming in and interrupting him. Or as he walked a little bit longer, maybe he is at dinner and it's just going to really trouble him to be bothered as he walked a little bit longer. Maybe he doesn't like to lend things to strangers. And as he walked a little bit longer, he's probably a stingy person anyway. And as he walked a little bit longer, he's never probably lent anybody anything in his life. And by the time he knocks on the door and the very gracious farmer comes to answer the door, the man looks at him and says, I didn't want your old Jack anyway. <laughs> Worry has this marvelous ability to blow things out of proportion. Anxiety is a feeling of dread or apprehension or uneasiness. There is, by the way, a difference between worry and concern. We do wrong if we do not have proper concern at times in our life. Worry is blowing that concern out of proportion. And anxiety is simply a bad way of fear. There, is, there are, by the way, proper fears that we ought to have. I fear when I drive the freeway. I don't, I'm not anxious, but I'll tell you, I'm watching to see if anybody is crossing over the double line in, in, you know, across the border into my area. I want to try to anticipate that in advance. Hopefully I'm watching for the uh, sudden break in front of me and the like. There are right kinds of fears. There are wrong kinds of fears where we become so anxious we in some ways become helpless. What is the pattern of worry and anxiety doing in your life? Could I ask you? If, as you look at your life this past week, what did you worry or get tense about this past week? 
Anything? And how much time did you spend in worry or tenseness this past week? And what did your worry or tenseness accomplish? What really came out of it? Do you know what comes out of worry and tenseness? The Lord very clearly taught about this. And I'll use three examples. One from Matthew chapter 25, verses 24 and 25. The man with the one talent, remember the story where the Lord had given people differing levels of talents, five talents, two talents, and one talent. One talent doesn't seem like all that big a sum of money to us, does it? But in, uh, in biblical days, it was we probably calculate the value now at $1,000, but that's not a true value of a talent, for that would be based upon the average working, laboring man earning 20 cents a day, which means he'd have to work 5,000 days in order to get a talent. Figured upon our average economy, the sum of the talent in our culture would be about a quarter of a million dollars. Now, I would suggest if all of a sudden somebody dropped a quarter of a million dollars upon you, that you may just be a little bit anxious about what to do with that money as well, especially if you knew you were going to be held accountable for it and when the guy that gave it to you was going to come back and ask of you down the road a proper accounting of that quarter of a million dollars. And Jesus critiques the man with a quarter of a million dollars. The man who had, verse 24 of Matthew 25, then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. What had kept this man from being more and doing more with his potential? Simply worry and anxiety. And worry and anxiety in this man stifled his initiative. He couldn't do anything because he was so anxious with the money which he had. It drained his courage. He didn't have the capacity to act because he was afraid. It inhibited his productive activity. He couldn't take on meaningful planning to realize a good effect of that 250000 and therefore it wound up squelching his responsibility. When we live in a pattern of fear and anxiety, we really become incapable of planning from faith or of making good decisions or of taking actions. It becomes something which closes in more and more on us. Look at Martha as another example of worry and anxiety in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. I may just uh, read verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. What about Mary? Mary, as a worrier, assumed needless responsibility. That's what worriers tend to do. And they tend to dump guilt upon others. They're not worrying and as concerned as I am. And they really have a problem maybe with other people being perfectly at ease. And Mary winds up therefore missing the best because she is so anxious. She can't really figure out or follow through what the Lord may have for her life. Notice, by the way, in contrast to Martha is the example of Jesus right after that in chapter 11, verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. Notice, where his priorities were. He had just told Martha her priorities were in the wrong place, that she wasn't really spending time with him, that she was anxious about too much. She'd taken on too much responsibility. And Mary had the better part. Now the Lord himself examples that, and he's not so anxious doing the Father's work that he has neglected having a relationship with the Father. There's one other scripture where Jesus talks about the bad patterns that happen as we assess the results of the pattern of worry and anxiety, and that's in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, the parable of the sower and the seed. What was sown among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, make it unfruitful. The worries of this life choke the seed of the kingdom which has been planted. What does worry do? Simply chokes your potentiality and it produces death in you. If you assess the results of the pattern of worry, tenseness, and anxiety, it is bringing you down. And I say this because one of the things that we need to do if we want to begin patterning after the Lord Jesus in terms of being at ease is to start where we're at and to recognize that continuing in that kind of pattern is going to just simply lead to further undoing on our part. We are given an, an opportunity 
Instead, to imitate the response of Jesus to pressures and situations which produce anxiety and worry and fear. Let's look at how Jesus dealt with the temptation of anxiety. Since Jesus was himself tempted in all points like we are, I believe that he must have had moments of anxiety, moments when he could have been tempted to be anxious. What was one of the great anxious things that Jesus could have been bothered with? As I've tried to think through the life of Christ, I would have to say that I would identify one of the things which Jesus could have been most anxious about would have been this. Would the Father come through? Would the Father come through? Jesus was on his road to Jerusalem to die on the cross. Would the Father come through? Remember on the cross, this appears to initially be his concern as he utters the cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Of course, we know from the Psalm 22 that that psalm goes ultimately on to affirm the nearness of the Lord. But the, those beginning words quoted on the cross indicate that at that moment, even, Jesus could have been level, entering in, had he allowed himself, to a deep level of anxiety. Would the Father come through? Now, as we, we look at Jesus' teaching on the subject of would the Father come through, his classic teaching on worry is in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 30. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed, uh, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Notice several things that Jesus is doing in this passage which reflect his own ability to realize that the Father will come through. He is on the one hand saying, why are you worried about the smaller when God has given you the greater? Inasmuch as God has given you life, why are you worried about the things which it takes to keep life going? And another thing that Jesus is doing here is that he is not appealing to our emotions in respect to laying aside worry. He is appealing to our reason, to our rational thought process, processes, and he is saying to us, think like this. And you might say, as well as I have might said, Lord, my problem is with my emotions, so why give me a whole set of reasons why I shouldn't worry when it's really an emotional thing? Why don't you just come in and heal my emotions? And the Lord is saying, I want for you to get a proper thought process. Because if you will start conditioning your emotions by the right kind of thinking that I have given to you, things will fall in a proper line. And maybe one thing that we ought to do when it comes to worry is take a 3 by 5 card or a 4 by 6 card and write on it a great big word that says stop on one side. And on the back side of the card, write the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And whenever we find ourselves beginning to worry, have that card with us, if it's in our purse, wallet, shirt pocket, or whatever, and pull it out and say, stop. And turn it over and begin reading what Jesus has said. He relied upon the Father in the simple things of life. He could rely upon the Father in the great things, going to the cross. So much of worry and anxiety really comes down to a question as to whether or not we are trusting God in our life. I'd like to give a little illustration, and I'm going to ask my boy to come up here and help me a moment. This is George Paul. And, George, do you trust me? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not too sure. I hope you trust me. Would you, would you do something to demonstrate that trust? Mm -hmm. All right. Would you, would you be willing to turn that way and fall backwards and let me catch you without your seeing where you're going? You think you'd trust me that much? All right, I want you to turn that way. And now you, you're sure you trust me that you'll be willing to fall straight backwards and you won't hit your head on the back of the floor or 
or anything like that. You think I'll catch you. All right. Why do you think I'll catch you? All right. Okay, then I'd like for you to just go ahead and fall. All right. See, you had no worries, did you? I was the one who had all the worry. I missed him in practice. <laughs> See, trusted me enough, he came up. I really think, and I gave you that as a visual image, that really when you're, the Lord is asking you to trust Him. This is what Jesus does on the way to the cross. He falls into the arms of the Father. He, he knows that psalm. Underneath are the everlasting arms. And you're not going to fall and break yourself when you're in a panicky situation and it looks like everything is about to come unglued. The arms of the Lord are beneath you. Jesus was so confident of the presence of the Father that in the midst of great storm, he could nevertheless fall asleep in the back of a boat. That's what I really call being relaxed. He was sure the Father would come through. I believe that Jesus, as a, as a person who developed not only divinely but humanly, as, as in his terms of his human side, Jesus learned this trust and confidence in the Father through a, a right understanding of the Old Testament. And there are plenty of examples in the Old Testament which show us how the persons who preceded the Lord who walked in the faith learned also this great confidence in God. Let me relate to you a couple of illustrations. It's a classic illustration of developing confidence in the Lord in Second Chronicles chapter 20. A king by the name of Jehoshaphat, one we don't talk about a great deal, but he was in a time of real danger in the text in Second Chronicles chapter 20. And the danger is described in verse 1. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Menuhites came to war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarm. Notice that. There is a time to be fearful. If an army were coming against me, I'd be alarmed as well. So Joseph had a proper instinctive reaction of fear. Alarmed. Jehoshaphat went into his chambers and began to worry. No. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And that is where he made his beginning to solving the problem. He took it to the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Jehoshaphat stood up. Notice his opening words of a prayer to God. O Lord, God of our fathers... Are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. And then again in verse 12 at the close of his prayer. The thing they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home. It's shameful for a woman to speak in church. That there were those within the Corinthian congregation, married women, who were exerting in the Christian congregation a sort of... Um, precedency over their husbands, teaching uh, the Christian congregation or asking questions which they could be better settled at home and therefore contributing to the disorder in the church and usurping the right responsibility that is given to the men in the church to fulfill. And uh, Paul must say to these, uh, sit down, be quiet. He obviously is not telling all women to not pray or not prophesy anymore because 1 Corinthians 11 has established the fact they can't pray or prophesy with certain restrictions on them. I think as the gospel comes into, into culture and into life, it, it, it brings enlightenment. And we have come, I think, as we have understood the gospel, the, the sort of a full circle, and we have understood that women's role in light of the Pentecostal experience, the pouring out of the Spirit upon all flesh, is one which allows them to fully participate in the age of grace, that these distinctions even have been broken down. And so if you look at the record, for example, of Christian missions over the last three centuries, and you have to look at what the fruit of the Spirit is doing. Like it was an astounding thing when Peter went to the Jews and said, God is saving Gentiles. That's an astounding thing for some that God could be using women in ministry. Some are still don't believe God used Catherine Kuhlman. You know, they will always contest that. Uh, did God make a mistake? Should he have made her a man? You know, but he used her. And uh, God has used the labors and the efforts and the teaching of women. 
I see, however, some dangers in women ministering in the, in the Christian congregation, in giving an utterance in tongues, or in prophesying, or in teaching. And I might just cite a few dangers I have seen and then go into just an exhortative thing to close this period of the lesson with. These things I have seen which absolutely destroy the effectiveness of a woman's ministry in the congregation, I think destroy the effectiveness of a man's ministry as well. One is a woman who attempts to minister who is known as a gossip in the church. And um, uh, just like you know, this would be true of a man, if your life doesn't square, don't try to minister in the name of the Lord. If you are an inveterate troublemaker, which I don't, looking over this audience, don't see anyone that's an inveterate troublemaker. Maybe all of us make a little trouble now and then. But that's not, you know, there are some things you need to get to be dominated by women. You throw it open to prayer and, and just maybe 10 or 12 women in a row will pray. And, and then the men kind of just sit there. And, I, and I, I frankly will tell you, I get a little tense when that happens. Because I think men should be involved. And if, and if I were uh, uh, insisting on structure, I would say, go uh, man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, and keep an alternation. But the Spirit doesn't do that, and I don't think I will impose that either. But there should be an involvement of men within the congregation and not all female identification. Why is that important? Because God wants to reach the men in the audience too. And the men are going to be much more susceptible to hearing the ministry of a man. But yet the whole congregation can profit from the ministry of either male or female. I think another thing that's hindered the ministry of women, and this goes for hindering the ministry of men, is I don't know what other term to call it than spiritually dippy or daffy. People that go around on clouds from place to place and are just really up in the sky and not down on the earth and are just kind of floating along on an ethereal cloud. I don't know if I'm the only one that meets persons who, who I would call not settled on the ground or spiritually dippy or daffy, but daffy or whatever, but I think one has to be careful in a Christian congregation. And again, I don't see any dippy people here. Uh, one, other th uh, <laughs> one other thing that I have seen that can really hinder this work of a spirit in a meeting is uh, persons who I would say would emerge to ministry with the voice of God the tone that has the voice of God. And so this, this, uh, this real, loud, pierced, uh, malish, uh, threatening voice comes out at full decibel uh, with a kind of uh, pulpit whine touched to it, screaming at us in God's name. And I often think, well, how would God speak? I think scriptures tell us how he speaks. He speaks sometimes like a trumpet, which is a very clear, distinct sound. But I don't think there's any, anything unnatural necessarily about God speaking. In scriptures, you watch how he speaks through the writers of scripture. He speaks naturally to them. Not to say that on occasion we can't really get excited. I get excited when I preach. It is impossible when I preach for me to talk in a normal tone of voice. I mean a normal pitch conversation. It's, you just don't realize how hard it is for me just to talk normally like I'm talking now when I'm preaching because I was brought up to believe that good preaching is to get with it. And I tell you, there's still enough of that in me that I want to preach my heart out, you know. I, and so I kind of have to put the temper on my spirit sometimes to recognize I'm talking to people, not shouting at them. In fact, once I wrote on, wrote on sermon notes, I had, these are people attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And then the word of the Lord comes to Jehoshaphat through a prophet. Verse 15, Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is is not yours, but God's. He comes before the Lord with a confession that he has no power, but he recognizes he is God's children, God's child, and it really belongs to him that the Lord has the power, and then the confirming word comes. The battle isn't yours after all, it is the Lord's. What a beautiful way to sit back and to be at ease and thrust the problem on the Lord. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And Isaiah again says in chapter 43, But now this is what the Lord says, He who formed you, O Jacob, He who created you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am your Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And Jeremiah, words I'm sure the Lord would have drawn upon as well, says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Would the Father come through? I think our response in life must be, Yes, 
the Father will come through. My heavenly Father watches over me. And I can, in the words of Peter, therefore, cast all my cares upon him, for he cares for me. That learning to cast your cares upon the Lord may require a long-term process of learning to begin to think the way the Lord wants you to think, or it may even come in an instant act of obedience where the Lord causes you to have a gift of faith and in that moment literally cast your anxieties and cares upon Him. Learning to trust the Father. About nine years ago in my life, I was coming to a point of really succumbing to a, to a, to a bad case of nerves. I was the director of student life and campus pastor at Evangel College and it seemed like every spring, along about beginning this time of year through the early part of May, I would, my nerves would really begin getting to me. Uh, that was a time of year when s- students will be students and in order to escape some of the pressures of study of balloon, water balloon fights and all kinds of other things broke out on campus and I, as director of student life I felt some responsibility for them before the administration and I saw it as my task to keep calm and order on campus to maintain the spiritual life and the decorum of the student body as well all that belonged to me you see so I was very anxious have you ever tried to be anxious about the welfare of the good behavior of a thousand college students it's just I was taking a lot of responsibility and how it began coming out in me is, is a sharp sharp nervous feeling like, like pins sticking in your skin. Those of you who had a bad sunburn know what the feeling is like. I've had bad sunburns and it, and it was comparable to that experience. No medical cause, simply surely a bad case of nerves. I remember on one occasion it, it got so bad and I couldn't cope with it that at 4 o'clock in the morning I got up and walked to the hospital which was several blocks from our house to get a shot just to calm me down. Just couldn't take the pressure. And I thought, Dear Lord, you know, am I going to have to live with this the rest of my life? This high case of anxiety and worry? Do I need to get in a low-pressure job? You know, one of the things that we we often look at is, oh, if we can only change our circumstances. I'm not so sure that's always the answer. I don't think it's the answer most of the time. And one night, while in this dilemma, tossing and turning back and forth, the words of the Lord in Matthew 6 about not worrying and not fretting and consider the lilies of the field and light really began to grab hold of me. And in an act of desperation, and I think an act of faith as well, I said very almost angrily to the Lord, Lord, I have worried about these problems long enough. It is now your turn. I'm going to bed. Good night. (laughs) And an incredible peace just enveloped me in that moment. I'm not saying what I did will necessarily work for you. I'm sharing it as a way of testimony to say that when there, is a, when, there, when there comes that moment in your heart where you really cast your care upon the Lord and where you really trust Him, you can begin to be at ease. And Jesus wants you to be at ease. Now, I'm not at the end of this message. My time is at an end. And I purpose that what I would do is continue this in the believers' meeting this evening. And what I would like as well for believers to do is to is to share additional words in the believers' meeting tonight on how the Lord has spoken to you in this area and be prepared to contribute. I've got as far as I think the Spirit wants me to get in this service to perhaps awaken your consciousness to the need to relax in Jesus and to trust in Him anew. Let's pray. How different, Lord, all of our lives would be if we would be able to let go of tenseness which comes to us in our freeway culture here where we are rapidly hurtling by one another all the time and always it seems like going someplace to do something. Or maybe if we're not doing that, sitting alone, maybe really lonely and worrying about things in the past that we can't live over and worrying about things in the future that haven't come yet. And we can be very coiled up on the inside. And Lord, you so much want us to be at rest in you. To be anxious for nothing. To be able to to live and to plan with the, the opportunity to use the full range of our emotions and mental faculties so that part of our potential as people in your kingdom is not cut off because we're trapped in the pattern of anxiety and nervousness. It's through your teaching, Lord, that you set us free. 
And it's also through your own person coming into our lives that brings us a new level of freedom. As we measure the level of at easeness in our life today, Lord, if there is a very low level at ease, may we come to you in a new way and determine, in, even in this moment, to say, thanks, Lord, for speaking to me today. And I know, Lord, that with your help, I can begin to develop the resources which will help me to be calm even when things about me might be breaking loose. I can have your peace. Thank you, Lord, for saying to us, my peace I give to you. In Jesus' name, amen.